powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, this is Football at Four. Football at Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. As the Eagles roster has evolved, but how much credit should we give the Eagles for how the roster has evolved? Plus, you have Zach Ertz speaking to the media. All that and more we'll get into with Jeff Mosher from the Inside the Birds podcast right here on 97.3 ESPN. Jeff, how are you doing on the first day of September? Uh, Jeff, you might, it looks like your mic is muted over there. I can't control that. How about that now? I can hear you now. It's like a commercial. Well, that's wonderful. That's how my first day of September is going, Josh, to answer your question. Uh, I've, by the way, it, it's not your fault. I've noticed that sometimes people leave the mic muted on their side, just like by habit, because you don't want to have a live mic on, on a stream call. So I can't, right. I can't blame you for that at all. That's actually very responsible of you. Yeah, some people are best left muted, a wise man once said. Maybe I'm one of those people. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I do remember I, – Totally off topic. I remember there being a Zoom call last year with the Sixers, and there was some person rambling in the background during the entire <laughs> Zoom call. Like halfway through, he finally muted his microphone. Like it, it was, it was hilarious. So, like I said, some people best left muted. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jeff, um, I always want to follow up with you before we get to the Zach Ertz stuff and everything else. Uh, the Eagles, I find very interesting. <laughs> they cut all these guys. They mm-hmm. waived all these guys. And, Jeff, they're all back. They're all in the practice squad. So are the Eagles geniuses, or does just nobody want their players? Um, I certainly don't think they're geniuses for, for this. I think they're smart in realizing that, based on what you said, that there was not going to be a very popular demand for some of their players. Sua Opeta, I thought, might have some demand being an offensive lineman. But, you know, they release – they waived two, two wide receivers. We talked about Travis Fulgham and Hightower. I think on Monday I told you those guys were squarely on the bubble, especially Fulgham, and in jeopardy of not making the team. They didn't. And so, um, I mean, you can probably – you need like a, a very big abacus to count the number of, of wide receivers that get cut by, by teams at the cutdown deadline. There's, there's 100 of them. So it's not like everybody's dying to claim – wide receivers, right? Same thing with some of the other players that the Eagles, uh, um, like, I, I, you know, I, no, no one jumped out at me as a guy that I really thought was in, I thought Fulgham might get claimed. Okay. I did think Fulgham might only because sometimes there's a GM or a head coach who looks and says, man, I can be the one that can reach that guy to turn him into what he did last week, year for four weeks. All right. Sometimes, but in this case, it was not to be, and um, obviously, every you know, running backs aren't usually in high demand on the waiver wire. Usually, teams are trying to get rid of and then add at other areas. Cornerbacks, we've seen Michael Jaquette. He needs a lot of work and development, so you're not going to waive him. You're not going to cl- remember. You claim one of these guys, you have to put them on your 53-man roster, which means right. you you may have to play them in a game. So, um, no, none of the guys that got cut that I think were would uh, were really in jeopardy of of landing elsewhere. And even in an offensive line deficient league. To be able to get LaRaven Clark back, I thought was a pretty good job for them. Yeah, I just I'm just shocked they got all these guys back. Like this, they, I don't if I if I double checked, I've looked at the practice squad list three times now. I don't see a player from another team. Am I am I missing something? Like, did they literally just like just like well, you know, we already had all these guys, just stick them on the practice squad. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I I, I, I guess what's surprising to me is that the defensive tackle position is not a position that they felt that they were going They have Ra- Raekwon Williams re-signs at a practice squad. Uh, I can't say I thought he had the greatest preseason. I can't right. say anybody who's mainly a run stuffer uh, on defense had a heck of a preseason for the Eagles because their, their run defensive numbers were almost astronomically bad. It's preseason, but it was still pretty bad. So um, I thought maybe they would look on the waiver wire to claim – a defensive tackle that had been released. But I looked and saw all the, the list of all of the waiver claims. And I think only one of uh, the 30 or so claim or less than that, but one of the claims was a, a defensive tackle. So maybe it wasn't a great defensive tackle market to claim guys from. 
it's I'm I'm very curious to see what happens. And of course, you know, obviously the other big news today, aside from the practice squad being announced, is the aftermath of the 53-man roster. Jeff, you and Adam talked about in your instant reaction on Night TV TV. That's a lot of linebackers. I mean, yeah. I, I was assuming you might go like five safeties because I thought that to me, Adams and Riley were like duplicitous. I thought they were kind of two of the same guy. They went seven linebackers and four safeties and basically like, what was it, five corners. I mean, I've, I don't think I've ever seen an Eagles team with seven linebackers before. Right. I suspected that they were going to keep an extra linebacker than they ordinarily would because Davion Taylor is still hurt. And he, I don't think he practiced today even still. So he's really going through it. So with that, you knew you had your top three of um, of uh, Alex Singleton, Eric Wilson, and TJ Edwards. And then you know that they're kind of experimenting with this kind of Sam position, strong, strong side linebacker with Jannard Avery there and Patrick Johnson. So, you know, I thought that they would keep like three, four, yeah, like six right there. You know, I didn't think that they were, were going to go seven, but Sean Bradley makes it. But I will say this. The initial 53 looks a lot different from the 53 usually the next day. In this case, it doesn't. It's, it's still the same. But they're going to put Tyree Jackson, I would think, on IR if they have not yet announced that already. I imagine he will go on IR. That's going to clear a spot. And there's other – what a lot of teams do, Josh, is wait for today to start maybe releasing players uh, instead of yesterday. So – what you're trying to do is take advantage of teams that have already kind of put their 53 and their practice squad together and are not looking, they're not as jumpy on the waiver wire. So maybe they cut someone like Patrick Johnson, a good rookie who probably isn't ready to play, try to sneak them through the waiver process and get them back on your practice squad. And then you open up a spot on your practice squad to do something at a different position because they're pretty light at other positions right now, but also not to be long winded, you can be light because the rules from last year on the practice squads, I believe, still apply. You can have two guys right. come and play for the regular. So you look at like Craig James or LaRaven Clark or even Travis Fulgham, right? Or um, I'm trying to think of who else might qualify for that. Possibly Huntley if they have – or no, Jordan Howard. Perfect Jordan example. Howard, yeah. Jordan Howard is a guy that you can you, – I think you get, you get to do it two or three times, if I remember, where you can activate somebody from the practice squad, play him, and then put him back on the practice squad. So – they may very well. This is like the new version of what you used to do when you released a guy, a vested vet, and then re-signed him after week one to a less guaranteed money. Right now, you just tell Jordan Howard, look, give us three weeks. We're going to activate you, you know, week one, week two from the practice squad. Then when we run out, we re-sign you to uh, a contract for the rest of the year. Jeff Mosher joining us, Football and Forward, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast, InsideTheBirds.com. The next edition of the pod will drop tomorrow morning. With Jeff and Adam today it was Q&A with Jason Avant and Quentin Michael talking about the Eagles roster over on the Inside the Birds podcast platform. Jeff, let's get into some of the things that happened since all of this went down. Zach Ertz spoke with the media, as you mentioned on Twitter, basically the first time in forever, what it seems like at this point. And he made some very interesting concessions. He was very honest about things. And I thought it was refreshing to hear what he said, that he had the opportunity to kind of you know, clear the air on some things. Well, refreshing, yes, because you finally hear, heard from him. I, I'm still sitting here trying to do the math in 2 plus 2 on this kind of strange soap opera. I mean, this really is a soap opera if you consider the plot twist here. He says nothing all preseason long, offseason long, right? Then the 53 man comes out, he's still on the team, and now he's going to talk. And when he talks, he really, in, in my, and I'm not ripping Zach Ertz, I'm just giving you what, how I how it perceived it. He, was, he gushed about the organization, the new coaching staff, the newness, wanting to be an eagle, loving it here, loving the city. I mean, that's a stark contrast to the last time he spoke, which was at the end of last year when he was kind of tearful and uncertain about his future and then all of the reports in the offseason. And certainly the reports were true. The, tre- the team would definitely trade him, just did not get the offer that Howie Roseman thinks is fair. Even Zach said that in his, pre- in his press conference today. He said, look, they're standing firm on what they believe is value, and I have to accept and respect that. So to me, that leaves a lot of questions still, right? I mean, the question I have is now that he's kind of um, professed his love for the team and the organization and wanting to be here, Josh, I would ask, well, does that mean he told the team he now no longer wants to be traded? B, I would say, does this mean the organization now has told him 
that they will not trade him no matter what. Okay, because remember, he said he wants to be here for the rest of his career. Um, and C, how do the coaches feel about this kind of juxtaposition of having Zach Ertz on the roster when really they came in probably expecting that Dallas Goddard was going to be their number one tight end, the guy they want to feature as the tight end? Do they want to play as much 12 personnel? Because as we saw last year with Alshon Jeffrey still on the roster and still making money, even though it wasn't a great fit, they shoehorned him onto the field. So you know Zach Ertz is going to play if he's on the field. So does this mean more 12 personnel than 11 personnel? It just, to me, opens up a lot of questions that were not answered in that press conference. One of the things that to me also about what Zach Ertz said was he talked about he didn't want to, you know, the reason why he was quiet during the offseason was he didn't want to, you know, burn down the city, quote, unquote. He was trying to, you know, just be quiet because he loves the city of Philadelphia. And I think it, he doesn't really answer the question, though, because – you can love Philadelphia, but be unhappy with the team in Philadelphia. Like, you know, how many times yes. have we heard about athletes leaving a team, unhappy with the team? But like, Aaron Rodgers says, I love Green Bay. He doesn't like Brian Gutekiss, right? Like, there's numerous examples. So it's like, it's like Zach used that as a way to, like, sideswipe the question and be like, I'm not going to answer that because I love Philadelphia. It's like, Zach, we get it. But what about right. the Eagles? <laughs> right. He was directly asked by Jeff McLean, if he felt that the organization has been honest with him from the start about his status going back to last year. And he did not say yes. He did not say no. He said it's a moot point. And then he went on to talk about why he didn't make a big stink publicly himself. And I couldn't help, Josh, and you're bringing this up, right, at a perfect time. I couldn't help, as he's saying these things, but think about what the, the, the chatter is today in Philadelphia about Ben Simmons and turning his back on – the city and Joel kind of calling out the Phillies fans. And of course, up in New York with Javi Baez and them calling out the Mets fans and how the fans get thrown under the bus. And I don't know if it was strategical by Zach, but to have that statement today that it's not about Philly, it's not, a, it's the best place to bay, play. It's the best fans. He has a love for here certainly makes him look a lot more mature and a lot more understanding of the culture here than some of the other athletes who have been here and in other passionate cities like New York. So I don't know if that was Zach's plan, like, oh, you know, I'm going to capitalize on an anti-Ben Simmons movement going on and show the Philadelphians how much I love them. But it certainly coincides right at the perfect time because that's where the chatter is in sports talk today. Oh, it is. I, I was saying earlier, Jeff, listen, the Phillies have won five straight games. They're creeping up the division. Nobody cares. I, only, I know, I know, I hate that. But the, yeah. the only thing I have seen online doing the show for Mike Gill all week, getting responses all over the place from the listeners, all we want to talk about is Eagles, Ben Simmons. They don't care about the Phillies. They don't care about the <laughs> Flyers. They don't care about Penn State football. They care about two things, and that's it. Well, I can tell you, I care about the Phillies, and I care about <laughs> Penn State football. You know that, and I would be happy – if I were in your seat right now to entertain those topics. And if it meant nobody reacted to me or talked to me, I'd probably do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did talk about the Phillies a little bit earlier, but it was like, at some point, it's just like, it's just this overwhelming response about the Eagles and Ben Simmons. And maybe there is some of the fact that Zach Ertz is like positioning himself as the, as the, you know, the different guy in the room. By the way, Bryce Harper did the same thing this week. Bryce Harper talked about how much, you know, loves Philadelphia. He wouldn't want to play anywhere else. It's like you have on one hand, you got Ertz and Harper. On the other hand, you have <laughs> everybody else. Yeah, yeah, there's no doubt about it. And um, I think Zach has always handled it fairly well since, you know, earlier in his career when he would get kind of chastised for not being physical enough. Um, but he, for the last five, six years, he is, he's done a lot for the city, by the way, from a charitable standpoint, his Ertz Family Foundation, they're doing some great things in North Philadelphia uh, as we speak. I mean, they, he's been doing it for a while with Julie, his wife. Uh, he talked about that in his press conference. They, they truly, he, he truly genuinely loves this area. I know that. And a lot of people do. I mean, how many Eagles, you know, will during their career rail about the pressure and the fishbowl? And then all, they all live in our neighborhood here. They're all, all over South Jersey and the, and the Philly Burbs. They settle and stay here because at the end of the day, once the, once the microscope – off them, they are. They love Philadelphia sports. They love the passion, and they like living in this kind of an area. Jeff, I also want to ask you about another guy who spoke to me, not specifically about what he said, because 
Well, we, we, we could do an entire podcast about Gardner Minshew at this point. I mean, <laughs> that guy is just an interesting character, to say the least. But I find it interesting that the Eagles made him available to talk the day after Howie and Sirianni came out and said, this is the number three quarterback. Jalen Hurts is the starter. This is what Minshew's job is. It seems almost like the Eagles came out yesterday, wanted to clarify, here's everybody's roles, and now you can talk to these guys. Uh, absolutely. If you don't think there's anything strategic about both Zach Ertz and not speaking until today, and then, of course, Gardner Minshew until after Howie and Nick talk, yeah, that, that goes on. It's planned. It's strategic. And I thought that Gardner Minshew handled it very well. Um, he understands his role here. He seems happy to be here. I think he, you know, without really knowing, but I think he sees the bigger picture here about the opportunity to – uh, at least compete to be a backup by the end of the year. We'll see. I mean, I think Joe Flacco is a backup this year, no matter what, but certainly for next year, but he's not blind to a situation that there's a very, un- there's an uncertainty surrounding Jalen Hurts as a starter. This is a litmus test year for Jalen Hurts as a starter. So if you're a backup quarterback, whether it's second or third, and you're looking for the ideal and you're that competitive guy who wants to start and you're young and you think you've proven something, You want to be in a situation where there's some uncertainty about the starting quarterback. And so that's where I think he probably sees the bigger picture. Also, you got to think that because of the compensation he was traded for, (laughs) I think it's safe to assume that as a player, you may want to be a starter in the NFL, but you also got to understand where you are right here, right now. Like I talked about earlier, like, I think Cam Newton has to reinvent himself. He wants to keep playing in the NFL. Like, I think he needs to realize he's no longer Cam Newton, the MVP anymore, right? And, you know, I think that players over time have to realize that they have to reinvent themselves. They have to recalibrate. And I think Minshew is taking a smart move and, you know, playing the hand that's being dealt him. Absolutely. He's got a fresh start, a clean slate, an opportunity to here to learn the offense, run the scout team for a little while while he learns the offense and an opportunity down the road to prove himself. And, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit like Jalen hurts getting the opportunity right now to prove himself as a starter. Minshew has the opportunity to prove that he can run this offense, do a good job with it, and then compete for whatever beyond this year. But yes, it, a lot of that takes that self-recognition that you have to have. A couple of the quick nuggets before I let you go. Jeff Mosher football at four power by the inside the birds podcast. Follow him on Twitter at Jeff Mosher NFL and Inside the Birds Podcast at Inside Birds on Twitter. Uh, today, Roddy McLeod was seen wearing a, uh, a, a a pretty substantial knee brace at practice. Now, he's in pads, he's got the helmet, but that knee brace is, is pretty legit. So, you know, should we read anything into the fact that Roddy McLeod's status? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, definitely. I, I'm not sold that he's going to be ready for week one he said that's the goal the whole time but i mean not practicing at all uh during the preseason was an example well at least an indication that he might not be ready for week one certainly from a conditioning standpoint when you're not taking part in any part of practices so uh again you look at the practice squad right they they waived two safeties but brought, brought both of them back that's elijah riley and also Graylin arnold who i believe they call a d-back he's he's got you know, safety corner kind of versatility. So those are two guys right there, along with the ones that they kept, which are Marcus Epps and Kevon Wallace and Anthony Harris. And I think that's it, right, along with Rodney, because they only kept four safeties. But that's why I think they brought two back to the practice squad. I wouldn't be surprised if those two guys are activated for week one and week two as they continue to get Rodney back. Um, It was a little surprising, though, that they probably – you mentioned Andrew Adams, uh, who who they cut. Um, because not only is Rodney coming back, but I mean, Kevon Wallace has been banged up for, for a lot of camp here in the last few weeks too. So it'll be kind of interesting to see how, if they got four healthy safeties to be able to start week one, Anthony Harris is one. Um, I think Marcus Hepps is, is healthy right now. So that's two. And then those two guys I mentioned from the practice squad will probably have to be three and four if the other two guys aren't ready, but we got two weeks. So Kevon Wallace could probably be ready by then. You would hope, maybe, theoretically, because yeah. I just – here's the thing with Wallace. It drives me nuts, Jeff. You know, this guy was one of the leaders of Clemson's defense when they won a national championship. Yeah, he had to come to the NFL and start learning. But it feels like his entire time has been here by Ben derailed. 
He gets derailed by COVID. He gets derailed by all these other things. Now he's getting derailed by injuries. It's like, is this guy just super unlucky? Like, what the heck? I mean, you can. Th- that's a microcosm of the entire team, right? I mean, how many guys have not been healthy? Davion Taylor, what was his? Uh, did he have an injury history? I don't know because he's. No, he didn't. New- he yeah, played almost and, and, every game at Colorado. That's what I'm saying. So, I mean, look, you've seen the, the way the team has reacted this preseason as far as um, preserving starters in preseason games, having shorter practices. In general, they're healthy right now. I mean, I don't think they lost anybody for the year this preseason, if my, oh, except for Jason Kroom. Jason Kroom, they lost for the year. Tyree Jackson, they lost for, for what, six to ten weeks. So that, that's going to happen. But the one guy wasn't going to make the team. The other guy was going to make it as a developmental guy. So their starters and most of their backups right now are healthy with the with some some bumps and bruises here like Kevon Wallace. So I think they're in a good spot overall health wise. But yes, you were hoping at safety, particularly that they would have better overall health. Jeff Mosher, Football at Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast, at Jeff Mosher NFL on Twitter. The next edition of the podcast drops tomorrow morning. Jeff and Adam will be together on the pod. Jeff, appreciate you jumping on. Good conversation. And you'll be back next week with Mike Gill on Wednesday, because Monday there's no show. I'll let you know here. Oh, good to me. Day off for me. All right, thanks. (laughs) Take care, Josh. Have a good one. Have a good weekend.